three acoustic guitars playing the same thing. But it's a neat effect. It reminded us of Lindsey Buckingham, so we thought of putting this instrumental on the record and we said, let's try and try it. recorded in our house, just an unfinished basement. And uh, I know a lot of you who write songs and do a lot of recording think sometimes that you have to go to these huge studios to, you know, make your dreams happen. And uh, a lot of times you don't. So without further ado. Well, it was, that was a, it's a half inch eight track. Right. Right. With, um, uh, we actually started the project on a very small eight channel mixer and then after like what one or two of the tunes we uh, we did get a bigger uh, full scale 32 track mixer but um, um, you don't absolutely have to and there's a lot you can do with with just um, consumer equipment you know not necessarily real pro decks yeah i'm passing around that um Oh great! Yeah, passing around that equi equipment list, you can see most of it's just toys. You know. Yeah. So how do you record drums? <laughs> John, would you That's like to answer that question? Well, uh, when I got there, I said, "How many tracks do we have for drums?" She said, "One." <laughs> I was like, "Okay." And first thing, first thing we tried to do was um, close mic everything, and it just wasn't really working out. The the room was really dead. You know, it just didn't really have a very good um, kind of sound, but so we were close micing everything, it just wasn't really working out. And you tell me what the mic was. You know, your standard AKG, the one that's shaped kind of like that, the big silver one. It's just like hanging out so, the drums. Um, we actually, also if you notice, there are no toms on yeah. the recording, so we used just bass drum, snare, hi-hat, ride cymbal on one cut, I think, and one crash. And we ended up using a little, um, you know, close mic on, on the bass drum, a little that bit of the snare. PCM, wasn't it? On the bass drum? Might have been. Robinski. I think it was a, a, a PCM mic on the bass drum. Yeah, I remember. And, and we, we just played around with, with the AKG until it felt good. It was actually right about here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we, we ended up getting a little more of the bottom end of the bass, actually a little more of the click from the mallet on the, on the head, and uh, just more depth from the snare drum, just kind of it out. If you listen, I mean, the, the problem, of course, was then you can't really mix it at all. Yeah. Um, you know, the EQ on the cymbals always sounds a little bit funny to me. But, but, but you know, when, when you get to that point, you just say, well, you know, we really wanted to do that. It's, it's, uh, it's an effect. You know, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's, an, it's an aura yeah, to the that's it. Yeah. Well, I remember with, a, pinpoint our audience. with a couple of tunes, uh, too, I would EQ the high end and send that to one type of an effect, like a flange for the cymbals, and then the lower mid drum kits and stuff I would send to another sounding room reverb sound and sometimes in the mix the drums aren't dead center they're a little bit off to the left or the right and then the effect is off to the left or right to just try to widen it just a little bit more but everything started just guitar and vocal I mean we've known Sarah for years and we've always loved her songs and when Cindy and I started uh, the record company, um, we really were just putting out our own record a couple of years back, and we didn't want it to stay just a vanity label. We wanted to sign other people, money providing. And um, 
So for Sarah, you know, she had always made demos, she'd always made uh, different tapes, and she'd been gigging forever. Uh, it was a matter of just putting the whole package together and getting a press pack together like we're passing around and getting some pictures taken and then putting her into that format of a CD and cassette that people can understand. So then all of a sudden people started really taking her seriously because there it was in the marketplace. People said, oh, I understand this, you know. And um, she had some ideas of what she wanted with the tunes. More than anything, she knew what fit and what didn't fit. It's just that gut feeling, you know what feels good for the song. So we didn't write out any parts and things, we just had this guitar and vocal, and then brought in the players and kind of said, yeah, no. The arrangements, <laughs> that's another thing about, another benefit to doing it uh, in your own studio or in, or in a, uh, a friend's studio or whatever, is that you, you have the luxury to do the arrangements right then and there in the studio. You have the luxury to just take your time and and say, well, this works, this doesn't work, and go back to things later. It, it really benefits in a lot of in a lot of ways to be able to do that. We're well, not uh, pressured for time. That's another reason why we wanted to to reach out and do it with Sarah because we knew that we could take the time and just kind of develop um, whatever we wanted to out of this project. So we're gonna have her play uh, one of the songs just guitar and vocal, and then start playing some different alternate takes and uh, versions of the song as it developed. This is the first cut off of the CD. It's called I Need to Be Yours. The first time I ever played it for these two was in my uh, room in an apartment that I was sharing with four other people in Provincetown. <laughs> they were both sitting in my bed, and I was sitting in chairs in a small room. And I got through playing it, and they both looked at me and said, that's a really good song. <laughs> I'll never forget that day. <laughs> Beautiful voice. <laughs> 